Hey, True Believers England team here with another first appearance video. This time we're talking about Iron Man. Iron Man is a, a bit of a different animal. He had a couple of daddies. He had Stan Lee, he had uh, Larry Lieber, Don Heck, and Jack Kirby. I think even Steve Ditko worked a little bit on him. Here's the thing. Don Heck, did, I believe, did the interiors. Jack Kirby at that point was only doing covers. Correct me if I'm wrong. I, I, I look forward to that kind of thing. But So he designed them. And then you had Stan Lee doing the plots. I think Larry Lieber ended up writing. But anyway, what Stan Lee said of the creation, and this I have to read off, so I apologize for that. He says, I think I gave myself a dare. It was the height of the Cold War. The reader, the young reader... If there was one thing they hated, it was war. It was the military. So I got a hero who represented that to the hundredth degree. He was a weapons manufacturer. He was providing weapons for the army. He was rich. He was an industrialist. I thought it would be fun to take that kind of character that nobody would like, none of our readers would like, and shove them down their throats and make them like him. And he became very popular. Now, Gary Conway said something else of the creation as he understood it from Stanley. Here you have... This character, who on the outside is invulnerable. I mean, he just can't be touched, but inside is a wounded figure. Stan made it very much an in-your-face wound. His heart was broken. You know, literally, broken. But there's a metaphor going on there, and that, I think, is what made the character interesting. Lee based his Playboy looks on personality uh, the, the person and personality on Howard Hughes, explaining that Howard Hughes was one of the most colorful men of our time. He was an inventor, an adventurer. He was a multi-billionaire, a ladies' man, and finally, a nut bar. Without being crazy, he was Howard Hughes, Lee said of Iron Man. All right, kids. With all that said, let's kick back, relax, and get into Tales of Suspense, number 39, the first appearance of Iron Man. <laughs> Okay, usually I start with a cover, and I gotta say, I never really cared for the first appearance of Iron Man's cover. I think of all the books like Thor, Amazing Fantasy 15, even Fantastic Four number one, they all seem dynamic. This one is kind of basic to me. The book opens on what a lot of Silver Age books open on, a big old splash page, Iron Man is born! Watch his awesome approach, listen to his ponderous footsteps as he lumbers closer, closer, for today you are destined to encounter the Invincible Iron Man. So the book opens and it says, In a secluded area somewhere in the U.S. defense perimeter, there stands a closely guarded building, the laboratory of Anthony Stark. And we see the discussion of two guards talking about how big a deal Tony Stark is. And inside, General you will see my tiny transistor increase the power of this small magnet so tremendously that it will open that locked vault. Ah, come now, Stark, that just isn't possible. One lesser known aspect of the Vietnam War is that they kept losing paper clips, so they needed the magnets to help find them, because, you know, off the ground. Yeah, true story. And so Tony Stark pushes a button, and they see the magnet go to work and start to make the door fold outwardly. The door, it's beginning to bulge. Naturally, my tiny transistors are so powerful that they can increase force of any device. A thousandfold, Stark says, and the door comes off as it hinges, cracking in the middle. Now, do you believe that the transistors I've invented are capable of solving your problem in Vietnam? The general says, Stark, after what I've just seen, I'm ready to believe anything. Yes, it was an amazing demonstration, but now let us learn more about the man whose genius made it possible. Let us learn more about Anthony Stark, the one who is fated to become Iron Man. Anthony Stark, rich, handsome, known as a glamorous playboy, constantly in the company of beautiful, adoring women. Yes, Anthony Stark is both a sophisticate and a scientist. A millionaire bachelor as much at home in the laboratory as in high society. But this man who seems so fortunate, who's envied by millions, is soon destined to become the most tragic figure on earth. Our tale really has its beginnings halfway around the world in a South Vietnam jungle, menaced by Wong Shu, the red gorilla tyrant. And he's there basically challenging all of the villagers to a fight, 
Desperate to save their villages, the strongest of the natives accept the warlord's challenge. Ha, ah, you are good, but Wang Chu better. And I'm cancelled in three, two, one. Just kidding. And another man tries in vain. I am strongest of all, next to Wang Chu. Other men are but fleas. It is over. Now let us plunder the town, for none can stop the victorious Wang Shu. I'm starting to see why they changed all of this for the movie. Meanwhile, on the outskirts of the jungle, we see the generals walking with Tony Stark. The red gorillas outnumber us. Our heavy artillery could beat them, but we can't transport such big weapons through the jungle. Ah, so that's where my midget transistors come in, eh? I think they like to be called little people transistors. So the general says, right, thanks to your inventions, our mortars are no larger or heavier than a flashlight. Our men can carry them anywhere. And then he says, take cover. There's the enemy. You'll see your guns in action. You're walking your freaking arms manufacturer, freaking Tony Stark, through an occupied jungle. At least you got an idea that the Americans in the movie had that area secured, but oops. That's why I was sent here, to make sure they work as well as planned. If not, I'll fix them on the spot. Just look at the Reds retreat. Stark, your weapons are everything we hoped for. Battlefield minutes later, the Reds never knew what hit them. But the jungle holds a thousand perils, some natural, others man-made, and we see Tony Stark trip a wire. And tripping over a small concealed string leads to disaster. Baroom! As Tony Stark is blown up, he says, A booby trap! Oh! Minutes later... We see a Viet Cong come across Tony Stark. Yankee civilian, still alive, him maybe important official, government, I bring him to Wang Chu, maybe get reward. Later, at the guerrilla chief's headquarters, his paper reveal he is famous Yankee of weapons inventor. How is he? Bad, much shrapnel near his heart, impossible to operate, cannot live longer than one week. And so Chu figures he could trick Tony Stark into making a weapon for him. And he goes up and he says, hey, if you make a weapon for me, I'm going to save your life. And Tony says, he's lying. If they could, they'd do it now. And just to be sure that I would live long enough to design a weapon for them. Tony continues, I know I've only days to live, but my last act will be to defeat this grinning, smirking red terrorist. All right, Wong Shu, I'll do it. Wong Shu replies, I knew you would. Fuck. I, and Wang Shu replies, I knew you would not hesitate to betray your country to save yourself. Here's room where you work. Plenty of scrap iron, plenty tools. Tony says, this I promise you, I shall build the most fantastic weapon of all time. TikTok and wokeism. Message! And when Tony Stark is alone in the cave, he thinks to himself, I'll build it all right, but it will be mine. Made for only one purpose, to keep me alive. Every tick of the clock brings the deadly piece of shrapnel closer to my heart. I've got to work faster than I've ever worked before and can't afford a single mistake. Then on the second day of Tony Stark's race against time, Chu arrives. This old one, Professor Yinsen, once great scientist, now lowly manservant of Wang Chu, will help you build weapon. No, I will never help the evil red tyrants. Never! Tony talks to the professor and quickly realizes that he won't be able to work in secret, so he lets the professor in on his plans. An Iron Man, fantastic, a mighty electronic body. To keep your heart beating after the shrapnel reaches it, we just might succeed. Think what a creature we could create, what wonders he shall perform. And the Reds themselves gave us all the materials we will need. Thus, a dying man's desperate race against time continues. Tony says... I've done extensive work with transistors. I could design them in any size to perform any function. Ah, we shall use them to operate the machine electronically to move countless gears and control levers. All activity must be coordinated perfectly. The iron frame must duplicate every action of the human body. It shall, my friend, it shall. This shall be the crowning achievement of my life. Hours pass into days as the shrapnel moves closer and closer to Anthony Stark's heart. I can feel 
the pressure. My time is running out. We must work faster. There, the self-lubrication system is completed. Just a little longer. You must have courage. That's what she said. That's what she said. That's what she said. And then when the doomed American's condition becomes critical, when he can no longer stand, the life-giving heart of your iron body is ready. Quickly, clamp it around your chest. The professor continues to put the suit onto Tony Stark's body. But suddenly, the warning light we installed it flashes when someone is approaching. It must be Wong Chu. If he enters now, all of our work will have been in vain. So the professor decides to take action. Wong Chu must be kept away until the mighty electronic body begins to power the heart of Anthony Stark. My life is of no consequence, but I must gain time for Iron Man to live. Then before the Reds can enter the room, the brave Professor Yinsen makes one desperate last effort, and he runs out yelling, Death to Wong Chu, causing Wong Chu to order his men to kill the Professor. Tony, frozen in his armor, hears the shot. It is done, drag him away. Tony thinks to himself, you will not have died in vain, my friend. I swear it. The Iron Man swears it. We see the Iron Man whirring to life. But as he stands, I'm, I'm losing my balance. He lands with a thud onto his stomach. Tony Stark realizes that he has to learn to walk all over again while he's wearing the armor. But the brain, which has mastered the secrets of science, is also capable of mastering its new body. And so, I have the feel of it now. I can stand, move, even walk without toppling. Meanwhile, outside the locked door, break it down, smash it. I must learn what has happened in there. Before Tony Stark can move, he suddenly realizes, wait a second, this armor could be my permanent iron prison. But this bitter realization is suddenly interrupted as the Iron Man snaps back to reality. They'll soon be through the door. I must conceal myself until I can plan my next move. Fortunately, Yinsen and I equip my iron body with many attachments such as these. I'll fashion these suction cups to my palms and turn on my transistor-powered air pressure jets. They work. They give me the power to soar into the air. You know, actually, I think that's kind of clever. They don't or might not have access to, say, the fuel they would need to create, like, jet engines that we see in the movie and such and modern day takes on it. So maybe the use of air. But, hey, if you are more prolific in the sciences than I am, can you explain how that could work in the comments below? So Iron Man hides in the rafters and Chu is saying, hey, he can't have gotten far, so find him, kill him. I'm going to go and amuse myself with my favorite sport. Then seconds after the Reds depart, Tony Stark thinks to himself, yes, Wong Shu, amuse yourself while you still can, for our moment of reckoning is almost at hand. That's what she said. <laughs> in the courtyard, we say, in the courtyard, we see Shu beating the crap out of villagers. No one can defeat the mighty warlord. I say he's a coward. I challenge Wang Shu. Who dares speak thus to Wang Shu? Show yourself. Let me see the face of the one I am about to destroy. As you wish, tyrant. First, I shall remove my clothes. Really? Nothing. We see that Wang Shu is surprised. Why do you stare, Wang Shu? What is wrong? Have you never seen an Iron Man before? You, you are not human. You are a machine. And you are a heartless man of evil who is about to pay for his misdeeds. Then before the startled eyes of the Red Hordes, two electronically powered arms seize Wang Shu. Lift him easily as they would a toy. You are not facing a wounded dying man now or an aged gentle professor. This is Iron Man who opposes you and all you stand for. So Chu, so Chu lands in the bushes ordering his men to fire upon Iron Man. And when the bullets don't do the trick, he yells, Get grenades! Get bazookas! Quickly, you fools! Quickly! But before the heavier weapons can be brought into play, Tony Stark says, I'll just reverse the charge on this magnetic... Turbo insulator. Naturally, you didn't know I was wearing my special super thermal B long underwear. So Tony grabs onto his device and uses a top hat transistor to increase its repelling power a thousandfold. Their reverse magnetism, it works like a charm. And we see all of the ammunition fly away from Tony Stark. 
Panicked by the incredible demonstration, the gorillas flee. Stop! Come back! The magnetic effects only metal! Sheer manpower could still defeat him! So Shu runs up again... So Shu runs into a building and up the stairs, hoping he can use the loudspeaker to summon his men against Iron Man. Listen, my warriors! 10,000 yen to the one who destroys Iron Man! An easy matter for me to create electrical interference to drown out his words with static and then to frustrate the warlord's efforts even further. Now I'll switch my own voice into the loudspeaker. Desert Wong Shu, flee into the jungle! What? What happened? Those are not my words. None could defeat Iron Man. Flee before he slays you all! In panic and without leadership, they'll soon be captured by the South Vietnam troops. And now to settle with Wong Shu. He's locked the door, but that won't keep me out. Iron Man cuts through the door, but Wong Shu has a deadly filing cabinet to throw at him. It knocks Iron Man down, and Wong Shu makes his escape. Iron Man escapes underneath his filing cabinet trap. I'm free, but it took almost all of the electrical power I've got to recharge. I'm too low on energy to pursue Wong Shu. Yet, I can't let him get away. Wait, I have it! Unfastening his lubricating apparatus, the Iron Man squirts a thin stream of oil. <laughs> I estimate it just right. The pressure's great enough for it to reach the ammo dump. Gods, gods, slay the prisoner now! We watch as Iron Man sets fire to the stream of oil leading to the ammunition dump, causing a huge explosion. Seconds later, Iron Man has recharged his batteries, and then I have set the prisoners free, and the Reds have fled in blind panic. It's all over. Now, Professor Yinsen, rest easy. You, who have sacrificed your life to save mine have been avenged. As for the Iron Man, that metallic Hulk who once was Anthony Stark, who knows what destiny awaits him. Time alone will provide the answer. Time alone. And don't miss more of Iron Man in the next great issues of Tales of Suspense. So there you go, guys. The first appearance of Iron Man. What'd you think? I thought that it got a little innuendo-ish at the end there. Overall, it's got enough silly age silliness to still be fun. And I could see why it carried on. I could see why it carried on. Although I do wonder, Stan Lee ends the book with him walking through a war-torn Vietnam jungle. It wasn't good for people who had guns. But he's got his chest plate on. I guess the Iron Man armor will get him home okay. And there you go. But let me know what you think in the comments below, and don't forget to do all the clicking and liking and sharing, and most definitely comment, comment, comment. Help out this algorithm so we can build this channel and finally get it monetized. Yay! All right, rock on. Anyway, I'd like to thank everybody who's already done that to everyone, all of our true believers. Thank you very, very much for watching.